see we are live robin hi All right. here we go I'm hi. Here. oh good i'm so glad you're here we're, we're excited and tess is really sorry that she can't be here today she's just barely getting back into work she's a groomer and oh, um there are oh, yeah. oh, and so we have essentials right we have essentials that are um that are allowed and you know these these nails and this matting and all kinds of stuff it really affects behavior and right. health right yep mm -hmm. exactly. mm -hmm. rumors are going to be swamped as soon as they are able to get people back in and people feel comfortable so yeah i can totally get yes that. yes yes all right so we were talking really fast before this we were actually talking about what's going on now in houses and what's going to happen in houses in the future. So, um, you know, again, enlighten us because I think what you said was so important that what you saw, um, uh, gosh, on a normal day, again, right. putting that in the air quotes was schedule changes. Right. Yeah. So mm. I did my train, I did my training facility cause I'm a certified trainer. So I've been do doing dog training for 20 some years. And I remember when I had my training facility, we would always get calls when school started and when school ended. So that was the time that suddenly the household routine changed. And we always recognized that, okay, those times of years are gonna get calls because when household routines change, you often get dogs that react by destructive behavior or house training problems, or they just start acting differently. So I was saying that this has just been on such a larger magnitude, the change of suddenly having everybody home. And now just as dogs get used to it, everyone's gonna start going back to work again. So I feel like making sure those dogs are prepared, especially dogs that had any kind of anxiety prior to COVID-19. It's just I yes. think, important to recognize that we need to help them through this transition, just like we're helping ourselves or helping our kids. We need yes. to help our pets. What do we look for? What do we look for? What, what I mean, I, I, I can, you know, we can all come up with the uh, over the top behaviors. I almost called it obnoxious, but you know what I mean. Um, right. Know, the, the I, I, what else? I look at really the most obvious ones that usually show up are some of the obnoxious behaviors. The dog's more needy or clingy, but then you get the what are very frustrating and behaviors like chewing, or suddenly your dog doesn't normally destroy things, but now all of a sudden he's chewing things or, you know, deciding to rip up clothing or whatever. And then house training issues is a, is a big problem that will sometimes happen as well. So I recommend people now starting to go through their daily routine as if they were going to go to work or go to school or wherever they would go and go through that routine of getting up, taking a shower, grabbing your keys, getting in your car and physically leaving. And I would say, keep a camera on at home for, just go away for 30 minutes, drive around <laughs> if you don't have anywhere to go or go somewhere and just see how your dog does. And again, especially for those dogs that had anxiety prior to COVID-19, you just want to kind of gauge their baseline now if you're going to leave them. So are, are they whining? Are they drooling? Are they pacing? Or are they just saying, okay, great. I have some time alone again. <laughs> <laughs> happy left. I don't know. Exactly. Exactly. Those Labradors that are just waiting for you to leave. Right? Exactly. But I think, I think have trying long, yeah. to see, just figuring that out now before the routine, act, routine actually changes. And I'm sure you would have remedies to recommend for something like that, where you see distress in a dog. Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Because that's the one thing that I found out doing, um, you know, uh, crisis management as it would be like going to natural disasters. I found that the break in routine was really stressful for the dogs and horses too. Um, you know, cats are like, you know, feed me, pet me and put me to sleep, you know, put me, <laughs> you know, on my side so I can sleep. But, but the, the dogs and the horses really react uh, strongly to a change in schedule uh, often, let me say. And, you know, very disruptive, taken care of by strangers or whatever, whatever that is. Or um, dandelion, actually, dandelion flower essence. I know it sounds so innocuous, but dandelion flower essence is fabulous. It's called the floral clock because forever people watch that. They know the zenith of the day when the dandelion is full open. And then it begins to close, and it's, I know, isn't that cool? That is very, yeah, well, now that yeah. you said it, it makes sense, but I had never thought yeah. that before. Yeah, so it's good for schedules. And and again, we don't understand how, when we upset their schedule, it upsets their behavior. Sometimes, again, you right. and I are talking 
I don't know, majority of the time or whatever, or the, the ultra sensitive ones. Here's the other thing. Let's really talk about, because I really want your input on this. How do the people leave the house? Of course, I would say, please, you know, spray the area, spray, spray the toys, the kennel, the bedding, whatever. Um, but uh, how do you suggest people leave the house? Grab your keys and go. I just say do it as benignly as possible. So, okay. you know, the worst thing for a dog who is anxious is to make yep. a big deal of coming and going because all you're doing then is highlighting what is a potentially a really stressful time for them. If your dog yeah. doesn't care, it doesn't matter. Give them a kiss, mm -hmm. hug them, say goodbye, tell them a thousand times how much you like them and then <laughs> leave. But for a dog that's anxious, that can actually make their anxiety worse. So we usually say, you know, get your keys, say goodbye, walk out. Don't make a big deal about it. And same thing when you come home. Like I would mm -hmm. actually recommend if you have an anxious dog and this is so hard for us as the humans, the best thing you can do for an anxious dog is the first five to 10 minutes when you get home, completely ignore your dog. Like don't uh, even look no, at that. Well, how? I mean, how do you do that? I, I know. know. It's in the back of your calves. It's harder for yeah. us than it is for the dog, I think. But okay, that's if, a good your dog, if your dog doesn't have issues, then sure, come home and you know pet them and play with them. But if you have a dog that's anxious already, then making a big deal of when you come home is actually going to make them worse. And the okay. other thing we like to do when we leave a dog who's anxious is try to get them preoccupied with something to do that first five to 10 minutes that you're gone. So if okay. they will eat, not every dog will eat when they're nervous, but if they will eat, then that's a great time to give them a stuffed Kong toy or a snuffle mat, or just even take a handful of kibble and throw it on the kitchen floor and walk okay. out. That first few okay. minutes, they're actually preoccupied not worrying about the fact that you just left. Okay. And snuffle mat. Some people don't know what that is. Could you explain it? Oh, and also, can we have a, can have we have a do it yourself? This is great. Okay. I love this shout out. I just happen to have my snuffle what? mat. Okay. Show us. See? No. Okay. So this is just a grid. The grid with um, little hooks on the back. And then in the, this was actually made by a friend of mine. She just took pieces of fleece that were all cut up into strips and she just tied them onto the grid. So basically I say it's like a shag carpet. If you're old mm -hmm. enough to remember shag carpet, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. then all you do is a handful of kibble or food, whatever you want. And you just put it in this snuffle mat and it's called a snuffle. Cause then you put it on the floor and you'll hear your dog snuffling his nose as he tries to find those treats. And it uh, it looks like yeah. a silly thing, but my dog, I can give him treats in that and put it on the floor and he'll be occupied with that for 10 or 15 minutes, just really trying mm. to search. So it's real, and it, the dog's nose, obviously we know how great a dog's nose is. So they just have fun. It's a mental enriching game and it's a game that works their nose and feeds them. So it's a lot of the things all at once for that dog. Okay. Okay, perfect, perfect. I, I need to jump around because I've got so many questions. Um, first of all, would you explain to us what CPDTKA is? Yeah, that's a certification. I've, uh, As I said, I was a dog trainer and I have been certified through the Certification Council for Professional Dog Trainers. So that CPDT means Certified Professional Dog Trainer. The KA means Knowledge Assessed, which means I've taken a test to show that I have the knowledge to be a dog trainer. And C that CPDT is actually an independent body that does nothing but certify professionals, professional trainers. So they, it's not a school I went to, it's not you know education I took from them, it's actually an independent third party that says, we're gonna test you to see if you have the skills to be a dog trainer. So that's what, that's what that is. And I've had that certification for years. I have to do continuing education, to renew it and keep it up to date, just like you would any, you know, professional certification. So that's mm -hmm. what that is. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Here's a question I've got. So I was thinking about this because when I was looking through your bio, it's like, oh my gosh, you you are all over the place in your career. And so author, mentor, business owner, Oh, and the conference co-coordinator. -co Let's talk about the <laughs> conference that you did, which was absolutely amazing. Are you kidding? Um, two days, five tracks going simultaneously. Vendors, um, chat rooms. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, that conference was, it was. It was a crazy experiment, but it, it worked really well. And we were really excited to bring that to the pet industry. And we were so excited to be able to partner with 
so many other organizations that are all in the pet industry helping their piece of the pet industry from APDT working with trainers, PSI, which is working with the pet sitters, um, Pet Boss Nation, which works with a lot of retailers, and then um, Paragon School of Pet Grooming, which works with groomers. So, and then the dog guru is obviously working with the daycare boarding facility. So it was really wonderful to just be able to work with so many groups, but and this, the software we used was just kind of fun to learn about because I'd never actually seen a virtual conference software. So where you could have an exhibit hall and you could run around into different rooms. I didn't know where to have my attention half the time. So it's very much like a real conference where you're like, oh, so much going on. So it's now, of and it's still accessible, right? It's still, it accessible. still accessible. Can we can we sign up, sign in? You can somehow. Yep, you can still sign in. If you were originally in the conference, then you still have um, till July 28th to watch everything. And there's okay. there's tons of presentations out there. So it's all on demand now. You can still go to the exhibit hall. So if you originally signed up, you still have access. And then if you weren't signed up before, you actually can still buy a ticket. And um, you can go to the doggurus.com forward slash recover. That's for the website. And you can purchase a ticket and still have till July 28th to watch everything. And it is, it has so how, CEUs. So if you, okay. if you need CEUs, either for professional animal care or um, sort of CPDT, you can get CEUs through watching it too. So it's great. Oh, those too. That's good to know. That's really good to know. Um, and so how many, how many presentations did you end up with? Because we ended, up, we ended up with over 30 hours of content. I don't remember yeah. how many individual presentations because they were all different lengths, but it's yeah. up. 30 hours of content, five different tracks, like you said, and mm -hmm. really it's all geared towards helping pet businesses reopen and survive, survive and thrive through this pandemic. So it's, I think it turned out to be great. There's actually presentations I didn't get a chance to see that I'm going to go back and watch too. And tell us what you think that biggest challenge is. Uh, you know, just, I mean, I know it's terrible to do a broad assessment, uh, but can you tell us what, what your major concern is or what, just with COVID-19? Yeah, with the reopening. I, and the, yeah. yeah, I think the biggest challenge really, because we work with primarily daycare and boarding facilities, the biggest challenge is that if we don't get things open and they get back, you know, into a higher capacity than what they have now in their businesses, they've lost so much of their revenue right now. So it's just really a struggle to figure out sort of a new way of doing business that doesn't require dogs to be in their facility. Cause that's obviously how they make their money is having dogs in their, their facility. So I think yeah. just getting the, the comfort level up where people are feeling comfortable enough to bring their dogs in and even to draw, you know, we are seeing people now that are starting to visit family. So they're willing to take their dog in for a weekend while they go visit their family but I think it's a challenge because, you know, people still don't 100 percent feel safe yet, you know, doing all the normal things that they would do. But I think and, not just in the pet industry, but so many businesses are suffering right now. And, you know, how long can you do that before you have to permanently close? And that's the that's the reality that a lot of them are facing. Well, you know, and again, you know, because the news changes every day, well, you know, it's kind, of, it's a horrible wait and see. I think that some facilities are open, though. Am I right for first responders and healthcare yeah. workers? Yes. Yeah, okay. So tell us about that. How can we? How can we support that? that? Yeah, there's several that are open that were considered essential business, and that sort of varies throughout the country and even sometimes within the state. But yeah, so those are still open and you can still drop your dogs off or take time off and get a break. And I do say for dogs that are used to going to daycare, the best thing you can do is at least start taking them back there a couple of times a week so that they, again, it goes back to that routine. They get back into a routine. So I think it's a great way to just call your local facility to see, hey, are you guys still open? And they might be. For other places, they're not open yet or they just cho chose to close. And they're waiting for the state to, you know, start opening all of their businesses. So it's really it kind of varies depending on where you live. Mm -hmm. And a question is, you know, maybe what what we could do, you know, kind of quote as consumers, customers, clients, um, you know, start calling and saying, hey, you know, there's three of us that really want to come in and, you know, have our dogs socialized together or something, you know. So exactly. even. Okay, and lot, yeah, so we yeah, can go we ahead and work, we've worked with a lot of people who have property 
And now they're just renting out their property. So you can at least get your dog out of the house and go take them down. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're just doing it by yourself and you mm -hmm. do, you know, you can still social distance, but now you have a place where you can actually throw the ball for your dog and it's safe and secure. We have places that have pools, so that might be an option. So yeah, definitely calling and seeing if there's anything you can do. We know a lot of people that have just bought gift cards for future use. They, yes. And then if you don't have, even just doing things like recommending them or you know sharing their social media posts, I, those don't cost any money just to help raise awareness that that business is still there. So yeah. there's a lot you can do that run the gamut. Yeah. And I so think, I don't, and I think that's ahead. for all kinds of businesses, restaurants or, you know, hotels are all in that mm -hmm. same situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, what uh, we're almost in the, you know, pen industry service end of it. Right. Exactly. You know, how can, yeah. And that's, that's going to be double hit, double hard hit. So author, mentor, business owner, conference co, co coordinator, dog guru co coordinator. Um, what, you know, I hate to ask, but do you have a favorite or do you have one that stands out to you? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I think, I think at different times they've all been my favorite. Okay. I would mm -hmm. say probably right now, my favorite would be, um, business owner and mentor. Um, so I love owning my own business, but then I really, really find so much value in helping others. And that's the bulk of what the dog gurus does is we mentor other businesses, either through online courses or through personal conversations or consulting or that kind of thing. And I really do love to see businesses succeed. So, which is part of why we did that virtual conference because we just really wanted to help people. So- And plus you, you allowed us to network together too, which was right. fabulous because I've discovered people that i had never met yet. And yeah, so exactly. that was, that was really good for, for me and for black wing farms. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the, here's another question. Who got you into the animal industry? Uh, and I always say who, because it could be a person, an author, it could be an animal. Um, you know, what brought you in that, that you've not left this industry? <laughs> That's the, the funniest thing is I grew up with not having a any dogs at all. Um, yeah. My mom and dad, we had four kids and my dad was overseas a lot in the military. So I understand now looking back on it, why I could never get a dog, but I always had dogs in the neighborhood that would just follow me around and just was always, I was just always drawn to dogs. So when I, I ended up not doing, I wasn't thinking I was going to do a career in the animal field. I actually was in the Marine Corps took off to go to a dog training school. So I left, I asked my commanding officer if I could have time off to go to this dog training school. And he said, yes, I came back from that school and I started just dabbling in dogs on the side and people started wanting to pay me. So I thought, oh, I had never thought about dog training being a career, but that's ended up really, I think it was those dogs that were in the neighborhood that followed me around that drew me to them. And then it was just my own curiosity to learn more. and one thing led to the other and I ended up, you know, now 20 some years later continuing in that field. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, literally service animals, medical detection animals, things like that, that are, that are so important and, uh, and military animals, you know, the, the horses and the dogs. So I, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. Some of those horses are, are, you know, I live near Camp Pendleton here in California. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. right. So they had that scrappy little horse from the Korean War. Was it the Korean War? Yeah. She was a little scrapper. She was like 14 hands high. And, but she just, you know, took that ammo and went through barbed wire. And yeah, yeah they've got a full on statue for her. So, yeah. yeah. And again, you know, our canine heroes who can not even, you can't even list them. You couldn't fit them all in the state of California. Yeah, it is and again, Mm -hmm. Whether they followed you home from school or, you know, <laughs> licked away your tears when you were having a nightmare, you know, it's, it's, it's that individual. So I love hearing that. And again, it's always a, it's always a who. Here's a question that I've really been enjoying people answering. What's in your teacher's briefcase? What do you, you know, what do you make sure you've got in your briefcase, whether it's for a phone call or an on-site visit or a uh, seminar? What, what do you find? I think my, I guess what I would call my superpower is um, sort of in the organization and efficiency realm. So nice. I have a lot, I feel like I have a lot of skills where I just can take things and make them a good system or a good process or whatever. But I think the other part of what I need and what I bring have learned to bring at least or in my 
uh, teacher's briefcase is just a lot of patience, a lot of empathy, and just the ability to listen. Because sometimes, wow. I think early on, my my th my uh, sort of my way of approaching things, I think, is to look at it and go, okay, here's how you solve that problem. And that's just not always the best way. <laughs> I think that's my Marine Corps background, is like, here's how you solve that problem. Um, but I have learned to, you know, do a lot more listening. I think listening is so important to find out what's going on in that person's business or mind or family or whatever it is. Um, and then just, I'm, I feel like I'm in a constant learning mode. So I feel like my briefcase is, there's constantly being things added to it just by different things I read or blogs I listen to, or, you know, things on Facebook or whatever that I just add to it all the time. I don't think it's ever static. I think it's like one of those briefcases like on Harry Potter where you reach in and <laughs> never ending. I know. I was I was visualizing when you were talking about that, I was visualizing one of those old fashioned horns that we used to, you know, that you'd listen with. It was, all, you know, a, a, literally a reverse megaphone. So yeah. because a lot of times it is the nuance of the person and right. what they're saying, how they're saying it. And I think what I love is, um, you know, um, I always, you know, I call myself a forensic behaviorist. Because I want to see your behavior, but then I'm going to backtrack, you know, gee, it looks like maybe there was a crisis or, or uh, not enough uh, handling. So I, I've had the divine privilege of working with like, I mean, it, it's tough, but hoarders, uh, right. slaughterhouse rescues, puppy mills. Um, it, you know, I've worked with some horrendous animals that have come out of that. And th I think the primary thing is listening to them reading that body language and then looking at the people handling them. So I would go to the shelters and I would say, you know, I take a remedy and I, you know, she goes, well, they don't listen to me. And I have something called teamwork. And I say, well, let's, let's use some teamwork. I'll spray your hands. You gently pet the dog and that's it. And I go, now, what do you want from the dog? She goes, I really want the dog to settle down and listen to me. And the dog is sitting looking at her. <laughs> and I know you're laughing out loud because you see this all yeah. the time. So I, I sometimes I walk in and I say, what is your goal? What what do you want from this animal right. on this day so that they they have something to look forward to and measure against? Right. So, yeah, it sounds and like I think you do so important. It's so important to know the goal. I know when I used to do my dog training classes and I had sort of the, here's what we're going to teach your dog. And yeah. then I learned after several years, there were some things I was teaching that people didn't, really didn't care about. They, so I, <laughs> and then I finally started saying, does this matter to you? And I mean, a lot of times the parents like that's, that's sounds nice, but really my problem is over here. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to learn to start to say, well, what is it that's most important to you? And let's train mm -hmm. that. Dog. Ooh, I'm writing that one down. Hello, what's most important to you? Right. Yeah. And yeah. then help them get there because that's okay. really more important anyway. So it's the same thing you're, that you're talking about. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So let me, I've got one more. Um, did we do this best advice you ever got best advice you ever gave? This That's is just crazy. for you. I think the best advice I ever got is from a um, person that I worked with very closely in Virginia. And he always said when someone says something negative and we tend to want to discount it because it's not true or whatever. Um, he always said, look for the 1% of truth in whatever they're telling you. Ooh. work with that wow. which wow. really makes you look at because you know it's so easy to just disagree with someone and then they don't they're just not seeing it the same way or whatever it is and especially if it's a criticism of something you're doing you're just, it's just easy to go my way is the right way and but he always said just look for there's probably at least one percent of what they're saying is true and wow. I go back to that a lot to say, let's not totally discount everything. Cause, and sometimes it's more than 1% if we're honest. <laughs> with ourselves. If we're, yeah. Yeah. If we're truly listening. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. I think, I think that's probably one of the biggest um, things that Ooh. I come back to a lot. And I don't yeah. know the best advice yeah. I've ever given. I mean, I think, I think I give a lot of advice to a lot of pet businesses. I think the one I talk about the most is just the fact that, um, gen being profitable and running a pet business are not mutually exclusive. 
And I feel like I say that more than anything else. And it's just really helping pet, pet business owners understand how to run their business. Most, most people in the pet industry didn't start into it to make money. They started because they love dogs or they love animals. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but then they find themselves a business owner without a lot of business um, education. So it's mm -hmm. just helping them to see where those things can combine to make a living and take great care of the dog and provide a wonderful service. So I think that might be the thing I say the most often. I think that is wonderful. It sounds like, it sounds like the mission statement for the dog guru. <laughs> yes, it, sort it of does, is. it really does. So um, speaking of which, I'm gonna show this and then we're gonna, we, we've already gone over 25 minutes. So um, <laughs> for more, you know, more information, it's um, info at the dog So yeah. the dog will get us everywhere. It'll get us to the uh, conference. It'll get us to what you do. It will possibly get us um, in, in uh, contact with you. Right. Right. Exactly. And your partner's name in the dogs guru dog gurus is Susan Briggs. She's the other. Yeah. Right. 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 So yeah, Susan was out of town. It's the only reason she didn't get her own screen. She is at the beach right now. Oh, her happy place. So. Oh my gosh, I am so glad. I, anybody who can who can take a break, it's it's so important right yeah. now. He is Robin, so happy to be down there. <laughs> Robin, thank you so so much. Thank You're you so welcome. much. Thank you for doing the conference and all the hard work you do, and and really that you will be doing. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely, very very <laughs> grateful. Thanks, Robin.